The Institute of Internal Auditors presents All Things Internal Audit. Hello, glad you can join us. It's a new year and we have the new Global Internal Audit Standards publishing in January. To start off this episode, we have Kathleen Sius and Robert Perez in our studio to discuss some key changes in the standards and next steps for CAEs. Kat, welcome and congratulations uh, on the new Global Internal Audit Standards. They were published earlier this month. Uh, and I know that it was a tremendous undertaking that took nearly three years. Tell me, how does it feel to finally have them completed? I would say relieved and excited at the same time because it has been quite a journey. As you know, the Standards Board started this project in 2021. And when they initiated the project, they spent a lot of time and efforts in collecting input up front. They reflected very thoroughly on the objectives of the project, on how the new standards need to look like, what needs to be in there. And with all that information, the Standards Board worked over more than two years to develop the new structure and to develop the new content. Last year was also a very important one. The beginning of next, next of last year, we had the draft version ready. We started translating it, and then we put it out there for public exposure on March 1st. We asked for feedback and we did receive it, right? The Standard Board and the Oversight Council were very pleased with our exposure process. We collected over 16,000 replies via our online survey, representing almost 19,000 comments, and we reviewed every single one of them. Uh, besides that, organized, organizations also put forward their input via sessions that we organized and via uh, written letters. The Standard Board reviewed, discussed, and considered all this feedback. We held weekly calls with them, and there were also two in-person meetings. And all of this led then to the final version that indeed we have just released. A lot of hard work, which led to this high quality standards, because we really believe and we are convinced that it's going to raise the bar for our profession. Yeah, well, obviously reviewing all those comments must have been a huge job. Uh, and you'll be receiving some additional information on uh, how the comments were handled. Or can you give us a little more information on how those comments were handled? Yes, yes. So as I mentioned, we, we received indeed a lot of feedback via our online survey, almost 19,000 comments, as well as the written letters, the input from our stakeholder sessions. And all this input has been documented, has been reviewed, has been analyzed by our standards board, as well as by the HQ uh, staff members. We have statistics on the received comments, as well as data on the content of the feedback. And all this quantitative and qualitative data has been kind of summarized, I would say, into what we call common themes. And all these themes were then weekly presented and discussed during the working group calls. And to come back to your question, yes, indeed, we have provided this information. We have published a report which you can find on our website. And this report includes some information on the due process, on the public feedback, and the report also contains the themes that we have discussed, uh, that has been discussed by the Standards Board, with the explanation on what has been decided and why it has been decided, right? So this informs the public then on how the feedback has changed and enhanced this final version. So obviously lots of work went into it, some changes, but what do you consider maybe the top two or three key changes to the standards? Mm -hmm. Well, if I have to pick two or three, then I would definitely start with the structure. Uh, we have now a new structure, a simplified structure. It was the clear intention of the Standards Board to simplify and align the structure of the new uh, standards. And I do believe that they succeeded in that. Um, we have now five domains. The domains contain then the principles and the standards. And all of these domains actually address the different roles that you might have in your organization. Um, so domain one, is a kind of a particular one. Uh, it's the purpose of internal auditing. This domain contains what we call our elevator pitch um, with some additional information as well, some key features on what is internal all about to explain what internal audit stands for and how we add value in our organization. Then we have domain two, uh, which is the ethics and professionalism domain where we integrated everything of the code of ethics and where we explain what is expected from internal auditors in terms of individual behavior. Domain three then is the governing uh, of the internal audit function about the relationship between the chief audit executive and the board. And then domain four, managing the internal audit function on the specific responsibilities of the chief audit executive. And then domain five, performing internal audit services for uh, our operational internal auditors on what is expected from them on the engagement level on how they need to perform and execute the internal audit activities. 
And I think also important in terms of structural change is that we have integrated now the implementation guidance in the mm -hmm. standards. So under the consideration part, you will find now the practical guidance uh, that we have or the implementation guidance that we have in the 2017 ver version, which makes it a lot more user friendly for our internal auditors as they will have now all the information in, in just one place. Then another key change, I would say, is the domain three that I was just mentioning. Uh, it addresses the relationship between the chief audit executive and the board. And in the previous standards, we already had a lot of these references there, but now all these aspects are made much more explicit and intentional. Uh, so compared as well to the exposed version, you will see that we do not longer have the must statements there for the boards, uh, but they are still in there. They have been transformed in what we call now the essential conditions. And these are then the key aspects that the chief audit executive will have to address and discuss with the board in order for the, uh, the function to be effective. And then if I can have a last call out of a, an important change, um, that would be the perspective of performance. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of more focus on quality uh, of the internal audit function in the new standards. Quality no longer just being conformance, um, and conformance remains, of course, very important for the internal audit function. But quality also means good performance now. So internal, the internal audit function will have to monitor and report on how it enhances its own uh, performance. So obviously, lots in there for uh, uh, internal auditors, especially internal audit leaders, to digest. But certainly, we should probably remind viewers that the new standards will formally go into effect in January of 25. Uh, so what does that mean, practically speaking, uh, for CAEs, for example? Uh, I would think the next step for most of them will be to uh, review the new standards and maybe develop a strategy to apply them to their daily work. Uh, how do you recommend that, that they should maybe uh, uh, begin, mm -hmm. what approach they should take? Yes. Yeah, so indeed the standards will go into effect beginning of next year, 2025. There's a transition period of one year during which the standards will then be translated into additional languages and to provide as well our internal audit functions with the necessary time to implement potential changes. Uh, of course, the biggest impact of the new standards will be on the quality assessment side, because that is the moment that you will have to demonstrate that you are in compliance with the standards. And there are actually two scenarios there. The first one is that you have your quality assessment planned for next year or later. Then the new standards will be applicable, so you will be assessed against the global internal audit standards, right? So, but in that scenario, you can also uh, opt for accelerating your assessment to have it still done this year. And this gives you then the possibility to still be assessed against the 2017 standards. The second scenario is then that you have your assessment planned for this year. Then you have the choice. You can choose to be assessed against the 2017 standards or against the new global internal audit standards. But a good practice in both scenarios is definitely to be prepared. And you can do that as from now to provide or perform a kind of gap analysis to see where you still have some work to be done to comply with the new standards. So there's also a third part of the IPPF uh, right. being developed, the, the topical requirements. Tell me more about that. Yes, also a very exciting project for this year indeed, the topical requirements. And I would like to emphasize first that uh, the IPPF framework still continues to exist, something that causes some confusion sometimes. The IPPF framework will still consist, uh, exist and, and continue to exist, but it contains now of three parts, and the global internal audit standards are the core part of the IPPF framework, but we will have still two other parts there, which is the global guidance, uh, our current GTEx and the practice guides. They will be updated, and we will continue to develop new guidance there as well. And then there is this third part, the topical requirements. Uh, these are mandatory standards addressing specific risk areas. For instance, cyber, fraud, ESG, and there will be other topics coming up as well. The main reason for developing these topical requirements is to ensure consistency and quality. Um, our, our standards are global, so we want to make sure that these common risk areas are addressed in a consistent way all over the world. And stakeholders also need to be able to rely on high quality reports in these domains. So this is a mandatory part of the IPPF, uh, which means that you will have to comply with them if you audit that specific topic. It does not mean, however, that you will have to audit all the topics for which we will develop topical requirements, but you still will have to do your risk-based audit planning. And when these risk areas then show up in your audit planning, then you will need to comply with that specific topical requirement. 
So we also sense that um, there is a lot of need for additional support and guidance in these specific risk areas. So also there you will see that in the topical requirements, we will have a part with very specific, very practical, non-mandatory guidance in these, uh, these documents. And the due process is also being developed there now, and it's going to be similar to what we have for the standards development, which means that we also will have this stakeholder involvement, as well as the exposure period, and the IPPF Oversight Council will also oversee uh, this development of the topical requirements process. So is, is there help available for, uh, or will be available for CAEs on quality assurance uh, reviews for the new standards? Yes. During our exposure period, we provided already a lot of practical information, whether it was during webinars or, or via our website. We had a mapping document. We had some other documents as well with additional information on specific domains. And this is something that we will develop as well now in the near future for the, the new global internal audit standards. We will provide for additional tools, instrument in the short term to support our internal auditors there. So we've covered a lot of ground on this, but any, any closing thoughts or, or comments? Well, I would like to close by thanking everybody again who was involved in this very exciting project of development of the new global internal audit standards. We are grateful to our internal audit practitioners, to our stakeholders for all their input, for all their engagement. We particularly recognize as well our members of the Standards Board. These are all volunteers who have put forward their expertise as well as a lot of time to develop these standards. Also gratitude to our IPPF Oversight Council for its essential role in ensuring that the standards are set in the public interest. And not to forget our IA staff and our technical advisors for ensuring the successful implementation and management of, of all these aspects of the IPPF Evolution Project. And then thank you, Robert, to you for this interview. It's always very nice to chat with you. Likewise, as thank always. You. And uh, obviously a lot of work still to do, but a lot of exciting times ahead too. Thank you. Thank you. Join the most esteemed gathering of internal audit innovators, leaders, and trailblazers at the 2024 GAM Conference, March 11th through March 13th in Las Vegas and virtually. Immerse yourself in a dynamic learning environment where you can collaborate and tackle today's pressing business and audit challenges while pioneering the frontiers of tomorrow. Register by January 26th and save up to $580. For more information, visit the IIA.org forward slash GAM. Thank you for joining us for All Things Internal Audit. For more videos and podcasts, including member-only content, visit the IIA.org.